actually, because Dr. Bryce covered some of this material already, I think it'll be able to be, uh, I'll be able to get through it very quickly. So I showed this slide yesterday for those of you who weren't here. The treatment landscape for advanced prostate cancer is really quite broad, and the biggest question is, how do we select the specific drugs for specific patients? But the other thing that's happening as a result of this uh, you know, plethora of new options is that we're getting, patients are not being cured, and if they're not being cured, the cancer cells that are progressing after all of these treatments is becoming nastier. And what type of treatment is it? Well, as you can see from a similar picture here, they go on hormonal therapy, their PSA goes down, they go on the RP, their PSA goes down, and then they start to go through one of two separate pathways. And uh, one of them is AR signaling reactivation. This is the idea that uh, the cancer figures out how to use the AR pathway, and you heard about the degraders. That's one of the ways to kind of shut that AR androgen signaling pathway down, just similar to what I showed you earlier about uh, the fact that we know AR is a driver of this cancer, even uh, to the end of life. Why, is a man, why does a man die with his PSA rising to the thousands? Well, a, a PSA is also an androgen-regulated gene, so if the cancer is still using uh, androgen signaling, then you can shut it down in different ways than beyond just uh, RPs. But the other is, and, and we're seeing much more of this, we're seeing men with uh, brain metastasis, liver metastasis, because we're basically selecting for this very, very AR, this aggressive AR indifferent variant. That's what it's called here. This is, includes neuroendocrine prostate cancer or small cell, AR negative or AR low, or uh, with those with low PSA produ uh, production. So I'll talk a little bit about this. But this, this um, cartoon shows a little bit of what we think is going on, which is that you start to see, of course, a normal prostate gland get genetic changes that lead to adenocarcinoma, which, and in this setting, you see that there's high AR expression and low neuroendocrine expression. Remember, neuroendocrine cells are here in, 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 in red. I'm not sure what they really do. <laughs> They're there to kind of support the epithelial cells in a normal uh, prostatic epithelium. But as they, as they progress, you see there's a neuroendocrine cell here, a neuroendocrine cell here. But basically what starts to happen is the epithelial cancer cells may de-differentiate into these neuroendocrine cells. And you start to see some of these here. And as we block AR very effectively, we really start to see this pure neuro NEPC, or pure neuroendocrine prostate cancer. So we are seeing more and more of this. And these are low PSA producing, behaving very differently. There's a lot of names for it. Uh, and I'm going to, if I have some time at the end, I'm going to show you some of the, what we're really seeing here, in, even in the, in the front line. So the, the key to the NCCN guidelines is just uh, really to think about doing a biopsy. Because we do know that neuroendocrine prostate cancer looks different and is biologically different, and you can see it right here. Um, and the treatments, as well, I'm going to talk about briefly, include platinum therapy, platinum-based therapy. You see carbo or cisplatins in every single one of these. It's a little like small cell lung cancer. So if you really truly have a, a, a small cell-like cancer, chemotherapy is generally the, the recommended approach. The problem is that it doesn't work very well. So this AVPC stands for aggressive variant prostate cancer. And there are various definitions, but you can see them down here. This is from MD Anderson's group. And if you give platinum doublets, that's like uh, cisplatin etoposide or docetaxel carboplatin, cabazitaxel carboplatin, um, this, may, this is kind of the idea here is to treat the neuroendocrine component if, in that picture I showed you earlier, as well as the epithelial component. What you see, though, is that um, depending on the definition, in general, these have very modest responses, maybe 20%, 30%. They have very short pro progression-free survival, and they live about a year. This is a terrible outcome. And you can see, it, if you look at a, a Venn diagram, pure small cells are, are really a smaller set, subset of these aggressive variant prostate cancers. So there, there was a clinical trial done of uh, uh, the next generation taxane chemo, cabazitaxel, with or without carboplatin. And you can see that if you have one of these aggressive variants, you can increase PFS from very lousy to just a little bit you know, less than lousy. Um, and then OS, um, really it works, particularly if you have a these aggressive variants. You've heard several times about how do we know who should get chemo? How do we know who is going to do very poorly? And you can either do the genetic testing and look for P53, P10, or RB mutations, or you can send molecular panel tests, because we know uh, that some of those, uh, for example, recently Decipher presented at ESMO that if you have a high Decipher score, it makes you more likely to benefit from chemo. That's, they're all kind of saying the same thing. If you have a genetic risk uh, that's significant, then you should get chemotherapy. But for the most part, we know that if you progress after platinum-based chemotherapy, there's not a lot to do. And most of this 
data is actually in small cell lung cancer. Small cell lung cancer, of course, is also a very aggressive disease. And there is data now starting to show that, for example, IO therapy may work in small cell. We don't have that data with prostate cancer yet. Um, there is a, 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 a drug that comes from this, I think it's the C-squirt, uh, lerbonectidin. Um, again, this is all in small cell lung cancer, and you can see it has some modest second line activity if you progress after uh, neuroendocrine prostate cancer. And uh, uh, Alan showed something similar. What's interesting about neuroendocrine cancers is that, first of all, they're all over the body, right? We all, most of the urologists in this room know small cell of the bladder. That's more common than pure small cell of the prostate. But neuroendocrine prostate cancers do ex share some of the small cell features. And, um, and there's this very interesting marker, DLL3. And uh, you showed this uh, very similar picture. And you can see DLL3, as you go from benign all the way to aggressive CRPC, you see higher and higher expression. 76% of these tumors, these neuroendocrine prostate cancers, make express high levels of DLL3. So there are several different ways to target DLL3. And um, this is one of them. This is the study from Dana-Farber looking at um, a drug called HPN-328. So again, what you see here with all of these types of T cell approaches is you have the tumor cell here, you have the T cell, you're trying to make a marriage between uh, bringing the T cell to basic, remember T cells are the effector cells that kill cancer. So what you're trying to do is just basically attach them so that the T cell attacks and kills the cancer. And so this is uh, uh, this study, I'm just gonna go through this very quickly because you see there's some activity. Um, this was a phase one study including small cell lung cancer but also prostate, you can see here on the, on the far uh, right, a neuroendocrine prostate cancer. All the patients responded because most of these cancers express DLL3. And you can see that uh, basically the duration of response is in weeks. For diseases that, like small cell lung cancer and neuroendocrine prostate cancer, this is actually pretty good compared to what we sometimes see with even with uh, things like platinum chemotherapy. Um, this is a very active field. I mean, small cell lung cancer, for the most of my career, the standard of care was giving um, cisplatin etoposide chemotherapy. Um, and finally, based on that New England Journal paper, this particular uh, bispecific T cell engager, that combination of DLL3 plus um, this T cell um, uh, binder, uh, was approved for, uh, for lung cancer, just small cell lung cancer, just earlier this year. And it's based on, this is the lung cancer study, it's based on this response rate. So again, you're seeing patients who normally had no second line option actually benefiting uh, with about a 50% disease control rate. So is this uh, gonna work in prostate cancer, neuroendocrine prostate cancer? And here's the data from the, I'm gonna go right to it. Uh, these are the patients who presented at ASCO this year um, that showed that some of these patients clearly do respond. But you can see that there's still a substantial proportion of prostate cancer patients who do not respond. In the overall, in the DLL3 positive patients, the response rate was about 22%. So um, I went through that quickly, but th this is the bottom line. You should keep an eye out for this. These are the patients especially if you're an oncologist, but I, I'm sure some of uh, you as urologists and radiation oncologists see your own patients converting to this, this kind of aggressive type of neuroendocrine prostate cancer. But I wanna just briefly uh, show uh, these three patients I saw within a short period of time. I saw this 78-year-old man who had a mixed small and large cell, primary presentation, his PSA was 2.5, he, he had urinary retention. He had very positive PSMA PET scan, a PIRADS-5 lesion, and you can see here that this is the PSMA PET, and he had an AR positive tumor with several of these uh, molecular findings. A week later, I saw this man, 65 years old, presented with a bladder mass. His PSA was 1.42. He was read as having a large cell, um, a neuroendocrine prostate cancer, but it was read as Gleason 10 at MSK and small cell at Penn. So a lot of language issues about the way these are defined. And he actually had a negative um, uh, prostate, no, nothing in his prostate on imaging. And the third patient was a patient who came in with Gleason 9 adenocarcinoma with neuroendocrine features, of an ultra-low PSA, and a PIRADS-5 lesion. And then when I did an FDG PET, his PSMA PET was really negative, but when I did an FDG PET, he had multiple bone and liver metastases. Um, and uh, you can see here that he basically had lymph node, bone, and liver. This patient actually, I just saw these three men six months ago, and this patient's already died. In the middle of chemotherapy, he died. So 
I think that um, one of the interesting things about these three patients is that we still see primary neuroendocrine prostate cancer. So these are patients who are not on ADT. So I do think this is a very interesting, you know, what, what's interesting about these patients is that they hadn't, actually hadn't even received any primary hormonal therapy, although that's the way we're often seeing these patients. And I think it, it, it it's unfortunately uh, reminds us of, of how heterogeneous this cancer can present. This is a small series from the University of Michigan. Over four years, they saw only 16 of these patients. So what is the right way to treat these patients as we get learn more? I think the answer is uh, to be determined. Okay, thank you. That's my talk.